I will now call this meeting to order. We are joined by council members practicing good social distancing, Councilwoman Williams, Councilwoman Stark, Councilman Waring, Councilman Nowakowski, and Councilman DeCicio. Thank you for joining us telephonically. Vice Mayor, do we have a call for an executive session? We do not. Yes, I would like. We do? No, we don't, not today. Okay. Sorry. No. Perfect. Um, I would like to ask everyone to begin this meeting with a moment of silent or silent prayer and ask you to consider remembering Commander Carnical, who gave his life in service to the city of Phoenix, a beloved father, husband, friend, and leader in our Phoenix Police Department, as well as our two officers who are recovering. Thank you. Thank you. A tough night for our city and for so many of the, the family of the Phoenix Police Department. We will begin our meeting with an update from our Government Affairs Department. And I will turn it over to our Assistant City Manager to introduce the item. Thank you, Mayor, members of the Council. I have joining me today um, virtual Clark Princell as well as Frank McCune and also Yesenia Dodd is at the table with me today. They're going to be walking us through federal funding and state funding coming to the city as a result of COVID-19 as well as the most recent executive order that was just issued. So with that I'll turn it over to Frank. Uh, good afternoon Mayor and Council. Uh, just to cover, today we'll cover um, the state and federal. At the state level 105 million was passed for COVID-19 funding. Uh, the governor has issued 11, 12 executive orders as today, which will cover the new stay in place order that he just issued in one second. And at the federal level, there have been three major pieces of legislation, which has provided trillions of dollars of resources. And they're already in discussion for a, port, a fourth piece of legislation as we speak. We'll walk through both the state and federal pieces so that you can gain a better understanding of the money that can be flowing into the government. Uh, we want you to know that most of these are very fresh, very new. The, um, the third installment of the Federal CARES Act, which was signed into law Friday, still has lots of rules and regulations and procedures to be designed and created. So we have um, as much information as there is at this point to tell you, but we do have quite a bit of information and we will jump right into it. I'm gonna have Yesenia Dot um, present on the state level, state level. Thank you. Good afternoon, Mayor, members of the council. For the record, Yesenia Dote. I'll begin by giving a quick overview of the executive order that the governor signed a few moments ago. He had a press release, um, a press conference earlier today at two o'clock. What the executive order does, it, encur it encourages and actually it requires Arizonans to stay home, stay healthy, stay connected. Um, this executive order does require in individuals to limit their time away from home except for the following any essential activities for their employment or if they're volunteering in any essential activities um, or also if they're out to use any essential services. The order does not require anyone to provide documentation proving that they're out of their home performing any of these es essential activities. Um, Essential services were defined by an earlier executive order that he issued about a couple weeks ago, and that list of essential services remains unchanged. And just quickly going over the um, executive order based on um, 
my quick review prior to this meeting. It, it also encourages individuals to limit their use of public transportation um, only to when it is absolutely necessary in order, in order to obtain or conduct any essential activities or to attend work. Um, another key provision of the executive order is that it preempts counties and municipalities from making or issuing any order, rule, or regulation that is in direct conflict with this policy. Um, and so what that would mean is that the city uh, under this policy would not be able to make any changes to essential services, essential activities, um, or anything to that effect. So I know that that's a very quick overview of this executive order, but again, we received it a few minutes before the start of this meeting. I'd be happy to answer any questions as it relates to today's executive order. Thank you. We really appreciate your quick analysis and know this is a difficult circumstances. I wanted to begin today's meeting with this update because I think it is important and has implications for everything we will be talking about today. I personally am deeply disappointed in the executive order with such a broad list of essential businesses including nail salons, pawn shops, golf courses. It does not send the strongest message about social distancing. We know that social distancing and testing save lives and we do not have enough testing in Arizona and now we have one of the weakest executive orders of any governor in the country. So I hope that the governor will come up with a second tier of essential businesses that better protects the people of our state. Council member, questions or statements? Senya. Councilwoman oh. Pastor. Um, so, essentials, do you have that list of essentials, what are considered essentials? You don't necessarily need to go through it, but I understand that parks are considered essentials. Mayor, Councilwoman Pastor, yes, I do have a list. There's a total of different, of 24 different business categories that um, are within the six executive order that the governor issued a couple weeks ago. Um, I'm quickly looking at it. I do believe that, that some parks are included as essential services to, to encourage um, the health and mental health of um, individuals going out and being able to, to access these facilities. And, and per the new executive order, one of the things that it says is that Arizonans are able to conduct these activities while encouraging social distancing of six feet as recommended by the CDC. Um, so I'm, I'm looking for where it says parks, but I, but I do believe that they are included in the list of essential services. Okay, I'm just curious only because Gilbert, uh, Gilbert City Council or city uh, closed, uh, limited their parks and limited activity at their parks. So I'm, I'm getting, I would like to know, uh, Mayor. I guess with the uh, uh, mayor. Yeah. Okay. I'm sorry, Frank. Um, mayor, Councilwoman Pastor. The fifth item on the list is includes outdoor recreation. But my understanding is, if for example, the the city or municipality is not able to um, monitor or provide a safe environment to encourage the CDC recommendations and the social distancing, that we could take some actions. Frank, um, I don't know if you want to provide additional comments to that, but that is my understanding of how that is being interpreted. Uh, yeah, that's exactly what I was going to add, is that if the social distancing requirement, which is also part of one of the original executive orders, cannot be maintained, uh, the city has the ability to um, modify or um, make adjustments to how the park is used and accessed. Mayor? Councilwoman Stark. Hey. Thank you. Um, uh, I uh, also understand that Gilbert closed the playground equipment, um, swimming pools, but they kept the remainder of the parks open to allow people to at least walk or run. Um, and I believe they were putting up signs to encourage social distancing. So, um, I, I, I had a chance, I have a friend that lives in Gilbert, so I had a chance to chat with her. Thank you. Thank you, it is my understanding that a wide variety of cities, including Tucson, Surprise, and others have 
implemented additional social distancing and, and closures of things such as playgrounds, basketball courts. Uh, our, um, and for those of you who are on the phone, uh, Inger Erickson, our parks director, is also at the table. Uh, Mayor, members of the council, um, indeed at Gilbert, just to give a rundown of things that have, they've uh, closed, the playgrounds, the skate park, um, splash pads, basketball, volleyball, tennis, um, and um, some fenced dog areas at some of their parks. Uh, before this meeting started, uh, Mesa also closed all their sports courts as well as their playgrounds. So Mayor, uh, members of the council, it would certainly be uh, reasonable if the council would like for the city of Phoenix to also um, close playgrounds, sport courts, recreation uh, centers, which would be in Canto and Rose Mofford, where there are basketball courts and uh, tennis courts and volleyball and handball inside the fences there. But, but certainly uh, the parks director does have the authority and the code for that, but um, it would be helpful for us to know the council's direction on that and then we can implement that consistent with the order and consistent with the council's desires in this local emergency. Vice Mayor. So then given, given the, the, the information um, that we just received and what Inger, what you just said, like I would like to recommend a motion to close down the parks, um, the, the you know, all the different sports facilities that we still have open, you know, making sure that we, that we shut down the play areas, that we shut down anywhere where, I mean, if the governor has already issued school closure, then I think we should shut down all the different places that, that we have in our parks that are still allowing so children to congregate. So I would like to make a motion for us to close down the playgrounds, handballs, wherever people are are coming together and playing sports in, in whichever order we, we can make that happen. So can I? Mayor, move? Mayor I, would, I would second that. But could I add that um, just to make sure that we're putting up adequate notice and signs for people to understand. And, and I think you're already doing that. Uh, Mayor, members of the council, yes, indeed, we've already posted every single park and every single um, trailhead about social distancing. We would add um, signage if this is the direction that we choose. Okay, thank Mayor, you. May I ask a question? This is Stella. We will go to Councilman Williams and then Councilmember Garcia. Actually, my question is for Inger. What is the use right now? I mean, are the parks full? Are there uh, all the courts open and busy? Uh, and what's your recommendation? Uh, Mayor and uh, Councilwoman Williams, I was out quite a bit this weekend and uh, noticed that many of the playgrounds were, were not really, um, and play structures were not really being used. There were a few kids playing. But there were a lot of walking, uh, walking going on and walking fitness paths. There was a lot of hiking still. Um, we did limit some of the hiking areas, which did cut down to half of what was last weekend at some of those trails. Um, I noticed that tennis and, and pickleball were very, very popular. Um, the dog parks are popular as usual, but uh, there, was, there was still quite a bit of activity in the parks. Um, my recommendation would be that we um, uh, get in line with the National Recreation Park Association, which late Friday recommended that we close uh, playgrounds down. Uh, but also, um, you know, I think basketball is another one of those things where people are in close contact with each other, and that's a concerning situation with social, social distancing or physical distancing. Um, so I, I think there's a lot um, that we need to think about with the outdoor fitness uh, as well. Um, those workout areas where people touch and then they go on and they run around the park. I think those are things that we should um, consider closing as well. Thank you. Council Member okay. Garcia followed by Councilwoman Pastor. I, I, I agree and I'm, I have a question first in, in addition to this. <clears throat> I think we, since we're going this far, I think um, because of the, the amount of trails we have and, and the, 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 how expansive it is, I think we should add trails as well to, to shut down trails and shut down these spaces where people can congregate. Um, but my question to either attorney or, or, or staff is if the same, does the same rationale of us not being able to um, make sure that people are social distancing 
in parks, does that apply to other things? Um, because we're obviously not able to monitor and be able to apply social distance rules to other places. And so does this same rationale of us being able to close down certain things apply to others? Mayor, Councilman Garcia, I'll try to take a stab at this question. So my understanding is that municipalities are able to put restrictions in place in parks in certain, certain, certain areas that are owned and operated by the city. Um, and so it is city staff that is not able to provide some of the um, social distancing guidelines in place. So I am not certain what other areas this could be applicable to. If your question is more towards um, municipal services or uh, private businesses, my understanding is as it relates to private businesses, we could, we would not be able to. Uh, but again, th this is just, uh, my understanding of this and of course I would defer to legal um, for a, a more in-depth interpretation of that. Thank you and uh, we do have an update on COVID-19 on an upcoming on our next executive session so we will talk about uh, what options we have to save lives and encourage social distancing. Councilwoman Pastor. So in the motion, could we add playgrounds, basketball courts, volleyball, and the outdoor fitness equipment and sports complexes? Yeah, no, I, yes. Councilwoman Stark? Um, is that Sorry, consistent yeah, with yes, your yes. second? I, I believe yes, that is consistent. Fine. Thank you, yes. And Mayor, there? may I chime yeah. in real quick? I couldn't quite hear who, uh, some, whoever's on the phone, but I couldn't quite hear who. Was that Councilman it's Waring? Frank McKeon, I was, okay, go ahead. Well, I think it was Sal, I am gonna say something, but it was Sal who was speaking before. Councilman DeCicio. Okay, uh, Councilman DeCicio, oh. and then I think I heard Frank after that. So, and just a couple quick questions. Does this include trails? So the question was, does this include trails? And I guess uh, Councilmember Garcia did suggest trails. The motion maker does not, had not, we had not yet talked about trails. Yeah, no, this would include the trails as well. Oh. And it would or would not? It would. Okay. And uh, some of the so, guidance I have gotten is that our shortest trails, such as Papago, are the ones that are having the biggest problems and that North Mountain and some of our the other parks may have I, I'm, I'm not i'm just mayor i'm just not going to be supportive especially if it includes the trails i mean you've got to allow individuals the ability to get outdoors to get outside it's part of their mental health i mean getting people cooped up in their home i think is just a wrong thing and sooner or later people are going to start breaking the rules and the trails in particular and we've heard it from the maricopa county infectious disease director that being outside is a good thing. It is a good thing to have our families be outside. I mean, you're essentially by cutting, especially on the trail side of it. But so I'm not gonna be supporting the motion uh, in particular because of that. But the second question I've got is where does this fall in line with the governor's comment that we should not be closing our parks? Because essentially it's closing the park. So the governor's, uh, well, I guess Frank, we'll turn that over to Frank for an answer. Yeah, uh, yeah. Councilmember, uh, Mayor and Councilmember DeCicio. So you're right, the governor uh, did say in his, uh, one of his original executive orders that parks do need to remain open, but they also um, did two clarifications. Uh, part of those original executive orders required um, the necessary social distancing and then clarifying um, the parks ruling uh, with the governor's office, if the cities are not able to maintain the essential social distancing requirements, then um, the cities have the uh, ability to um, regulate use, close down uh, certain areas of parks or discontinue use in parks if the social distancing requirements can't uh, be maintained. And that's what places like Gilbert um, made those decisions. They did it, they worked with the governor's office to let them know that was happening and uh, everybody moved forward. 
Mayor, if I might. <clears throat> I think I'm uh, hearing the, there might be consensus among the council about, I think we need someone on the phone to mute. We're getting feedback. Thank you. I think there's consensus I'm hearing around playground structures, basketball courts, volleyball courts, the outdoor phys fitness equipment, and our large sports complexes. I might suggest if the council gave us direction on that, and then it sounds as if there might need to be further discussion about trails. The governor's order talked about green spaces and open spaces, and, and I think trails might be getting into that. And we could certainly come back by Thursday and have a, a discussion about those if it would look like the two things were gonna mix and, and, and cause a problem. Uh, we might just see if, if the original piece of those playground structures, outdoor fitness equipment, basketball, volleyball courts, and sports complexes was something there was more uh, uniform agreement on and, and separate the other piece out for further discussion. And I have a question for our parks director. Uh, we had two physicians reach out about water fountains saying that droplets are one of the ways that COVID-19 spreads. Did the parks professionals provide any guidance about public water fountains, which are obviously very important, particularly in our summer heat, but could be a source of droplets? Uh, Mayor, members of the council, they have not given any kind of guidance on drinking fountains or restrooms at this point. Um, they did specifically say playgrounds and play structures. Okay, then I would ask if we are gonna come back with guidance on trails, including our shortest trails, that we look at those type of facilities and try to understand what public health professionals are recommending. We certainly want to lead with data and, and do what we can to do the, the our interventions that make most sense to protect our community, but it was something that healthcare professionals had brought to my attention. And um, is that, so we would do, so we would do parks. So we would leave trails for a different discussion um, sooner sooner rather than later, even though I am a little nervous about the rail, about the trails as we're coming upon Easter. Like we just need to make sure that we have like a real plan in place for Easter. Um, Cause from what I understand and talking to different people, that's when we will have a huge spike up if we don't, if we don't mo monitor that. I, I just think we just have to move on it very quickly. And you guys are doing a wonderful job. I'm not saying that you guys are not moving quickly, but just saying that we You're just correct. need, we, we just need to figure figure that out ASAP, but definitely have a plan in place um, for, for Easter. And just I Council agree. Member Garcia. I agree. Mayor. Uh, Council Member Garcia, and then we'll go to the phone. The, the reason I brought up trails is a couple of things. I think in the parking lots, we aren't able to keep people away from each other. And most of the trails have one entry point. Um, and I feel like we're also exposing our staff who's being there and trying to limit things. And so I think if we're doing kind of taking people away from parks, we're basically gonna push people towards the trails. And I, that's my concern is that people are no longer gonna be able to go or do certain things that we're just gonna grow uh, the amount of people on the trails. And so I feel like if, if we're gonna do this, I'd prefer to do something uniformly that sends a message that we're actually encouraging people to stay home rather than um, look for other options. And so if we leave an opening, I feel that we're sending a message and they're gonna push more people to go to those places. Okay, so just, um and would we want, possibly as we have the COVID-19 update on executive session to understand what guidance we have legally about trails also on Wednesday? Yes. Um, so I think just to summarize, we would be voting today on a policy similar to what Mesa has already adopted with athletic courts and playgrounds. And then we would come back first in executive session on Wednesday and then on Thursday with a policy update about trails, bathrooms, water fountains. Mayor, we can do that. Uh, Mayor? That would also be consistent with, uh, as Inger said, the Parks and Recreation, National Recreation Parks Association guidance, uh, the first part that you discussed. And we would also ask you to consult with our Parks Board as well. Yes. Uh, wonderful. Councilman DeCicio. Oh, Thank you, Mayor. So just a couple things. One, when you're talking about that athletic courts and things like that, you're talking about just the ones that are controlled by the city of Phoenix, not private ones, correct? 
Yes. And we're not shutting down golf courses or anything else like that. Golf courses are an essential service as deemed by Governor Ducey. <laughs> okay, I just want to make sure. Well, they're packed right now. And because people are looking to do outdoor things, that's just what it is. And just a word of caution when it comes to the trails. I mean, these are, in, this, this is primarily my district now because the people in my, I've got a lot of the trails in my district and some of them are in District 8 as well and throughout in District 3. But, you know, I, I'm, I'm going to be strongly opposed to that. I think that it's a wrong idea. Um, I think you're going to have an uprising once the public finds out we're even contemplating shutting down trails. I'm glad you pulled it because I think it's going to end up dying on Wednesday. If you would have done it today, I think you would have got it through. But on Wednesday, you're going to hear an outpouring of individuals that are opposed to this. And these are primarily people in my district and places like that in the city. Uh, but I think Carlos, uh, Councilman Garcia brings up a good point, is that it, but it, it, you're basically shutting down areas. I'm just giving you a thought here. that are used by individuals that have nowhere else to go. So what your motion is today is going to have a higher impact on those people that need those, you know, basically the flatland park because they don't have anywhere else to go. So I – on multiple issues, I think you're running into some problems here because you're really not going to be inclusive of everybody, quite frankly. But on the other side of it, I'm glad it's going to be pulled from this for today. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you. And I guess to Mayor, correct I, my earlier statement, I think we could, do it, could close the indoor facilities at golf courses, which would be consistent with the governor's directive, but we could not close the outdoor portion. It, Frank, is that right? Or Yesenia? that we can restrict services but not close them completely. That's correct, Mayor. Wonderful. And I think Councilwoman Stark was next. Yes, yeah, sorry, I had to get off mute. So I, I, I would like to slow down the trails as well. Um, Sal, you're not going to believe this, but there's more trails in District 3 than there are in 6. But um, okay. having said that, I... Um, if we're going to deliver this kind of message, let's start counting in our chambers and see how many people are sitting there. Because I think CDC recommends 10. Thank you. And I'm certainly supportive of going to virtual council meetings, and I believe we have had a technology breakthrough recently that may allow that. Um, and I'm sorry, it was then who, uh, there was an additional phone call, a person on the phone. Mayor. Uh, Councilman Noah Kowski. Mayor, it's, it's Jim Waring. Can I call? Oh. Uh, Councilman Waring, I apologize. Oh, okay. You're ready for me? Okay. Um, so, so I also would have an issue with the trails. Um, part of it is, you know, not all trails, and, and it's kind of been alluded to already, not all trails are created equal. So because the gyms have been closed down for a few weeks, and that's what I like to do, I've, I've been walking every day or going on the trails every day. I, I think um, – I don't want to speak for everybody there, but I've been really pleased with what I've seen. When I'm out on surface streets, you see somebody coming, everybody crosses the street, you know, and then just kind of whoever makes the first move crosses over if you're in a neighborhood. And then as I get to our trails, people are absolutely keeping well clear of each other. Everybody seems to know the rules. Everybody's polite. Everybody waves. and um, But everybody's staying away from each other. I've been on uh, uh, trails and, and streets pretty much every day for the last, you know, 10 days or so, hour or more every day. I mean, people are definitely keeping apart. I think Sal's point is well taken that, that people do need exercise, which I think uh, a doctor from Maricopa County mentioned last week. Um, so I'm supportive of some of what I'm hearing, but I'm not supportive of others. For example, I have a park near my home, which is actually a Scottsdale Park, but it's yes, it's got basketball courts and and uh, uh, equipment for for the kids to climb on, but it's also got huge open areas. And at some point, you know, I, I think it's a third of Americans. I'm sure Phoenix is no different. Have dogs, and many houses have multiple dogs, and they got to take those dogs somewhere, um, particularly if they live in an apartment or something. To Sal's point, not everybody. Um, is going to get treated equally in this. So that's an issue. 
Um, and, and from what I've seen, people definitely uh, – they definitely seem to understand about the social distancing, not only understand it, they seem to be embracing it with good nature from what I've seen. I think we need to be, frankly, a little more trusting. I understand, like I said, about the, the playground equipment because it could cling to that. you got kids climbing on it. I understand why you don't want people rubbing up against each other playing basketball. Um, but But just closing down any of the open spaces, and it was unclear to me if that's what we're we're talking about, but I think that it is closing down the dog parks where people generally stay away from each other because they don't necessarily want their dogs jumping at each other. And then uh, and I've had a certain experience with that. And then um, the trails. And, and I understand that there are differences in trails. They also climb Camelback Mountain. That, that's a more confined area. You are going to have people very close to each other. So those are different things. Um, it sounds like you guys have – from what I can kind of gather, it sounds like you got the votes to close all that stuff if that's what you want to do. If you feel strongly about it, then you should probably just do it today in the interest of, as Carlos mentioned, uniformity. But I'm just trying to make some counter arguments about why I might disagree or that I think we should have a more nuanced view of, you know, not every trail is created equal. And we do want people to get outside in part because you mentioned about the heat. They're going to be cooped up. We're all going to be cooped up indoors you know for several months certainly for most of the day and i just i hate to see that and exercise is, is really helpful as we heard from our county expert you know just last week so um i just, I just want to make those points thank you mayor uh, mayor councilman decisio i get the idea of creek uh, keeping it uniform because that doesn't look like you're picking on one public versus another when you're shutting down trails I get that point because you're creating a statement and you're creating a message. I get all that as well. But to Jim's point, people need to be outside. People need to be in the park. People need to be able to run. They need to do that. And shutting down the trail really impacts Jim and the constituents Jim and I represent primarily because the flatland parks are you know, generally, if they're not as full, at least in my district, but the trails do get full, and they are pretty busy. But people do, you know, they're very respectful. They've done. I hiked myself. I just went out yesterday myself, and I think that if shutting down a trail would just be horrible. People need to be outside. They need to enjoy the Arizona. They need to be able to get outside. Otherwise, they're going to go stir crazy inside their homes. So, I get the need to create uniformity here, and you know, basically treat everybody the same. But if you want to take out my district and Jim's district, I think we'd be good with that. I think that the park should stay open, personally. I even believe the Flatland Park should stay open. But I don't, you know, I don't represent a lot of, lot, a lot of large Flatland parks. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, Councilman, thank you, Vice Mayor. So I, I think um, part of as someone that does do some hiking i i i know how crowded um the trails can get and how much worse they can get by shutting down by closing down the parks um so what if we so what if we modified it and we and we can look at it again on wednesday or thursday but maybe now we just modify it and we say that we close down the ones that are incredibly crowded which is pistawa peak camelback North Papago and maybe the South Mountain Trail. Those are the ones that are the most popular and those are the ones, at least Camelback and Pistawa Peak both have handrails. And that makes me really nervous, um, people going up and down those mountains. So maybe we limit it to those now and then we can look at a bigger plan at each session on, on Wednesday or, or, the, or the next meeting. Okay, so that seems like a list focused on, I would generally, for most of those, call them the shorter trails. I don't know if maybe our parks director could. Mayor and members of the, of the city council and vice mayor Guadardo, um, the, the ones that you mentioned, with the exception of um, Papago, Papago is very short. It's a point two hike, which is why it's very popular, and it's a, view, a beautiful view of sunset, sunrises, those things. 
Um, the other ones are, are more difficult, like Payasua is about a mile up, and it's more difficult, and people use it for training. So it's not necessarily easy or short. It, it is, is actually a challenging, as is, um, as is Camelback's echo, echo side. Um, the Dobbins Lookout is where a lot of cars drive up to, and we were limiting those this last weekend. And when we, we limited those areas this last weekend, what we saw is a d decrease of at least 50% uh, uh, of, of participation in some of them. Some of them we saw quite a, a tremendous uh, reduction because we limited parking. So as some people came in or went out, we let more people come in. So we were able to regulate those this weekend, and it really seemed to be effective. There were times where I looked at the parking lot, uh, staff sent pictures, looked at the parking lot, and it was, half, it was half full, which meant there weren't as many people next to each other going up and down. So I think that was a good way of managing it for this last weekend. And it's something, when I, when I asked staff today, how has it looked today, it was very quiet in the hiking uh, trails today, possibly because it's Monday, but I think also there's a little bit of uh, awareness that is uh, increased. Um, I hiked myself this weekend, and someone mentioned to me on the trail, did I see you on TV today or yesterday? And the answer was yes. And she said, please, please don't close down the trails. And I said, we have to be safe. We have to be healthy. We have to do things the right way. Help us help you. Mayor, I just, and Vice Mayor, I might just add, I think, I think a decision to close the trails is, is a shock to the system that you should give more time to. And I, what I would suggest if you want to pursue that is let us come back to you on Thursday with more of the data that Inger has, and then if it's something the council wants to do, it gives it time to lead the public before the next weekend, which is really where uh, you have the usage. I, I would just be concerned in advising you about um, a decision that quick on things that are as, as important to Phoenicians as trails uh, might, might be too big of a shock to the system. So I, I believe that recommendation would be to, to stay with the, with the motion about the structures and let us bring you back data on Thursday about the trails um, so that you can evaluate that. Vice Mayor and then Councilman DeCicio. Okay, that's fine. Then let's move with what, I, I don't wanna continue to go um, in circles here. So let's move with what we have now and then we can have um, Inger and your team come back with a very strict plan for trails um, and, and Easter on next, on Thursday. Thank you, Vice Mayor. Councilman DeCicio. Uh, thank you, Mayor. I'm still going to be opposing shutting down any of our parks because I think it's important for families and for people to get outside. Like to Jim's point, people have been really, as a whole, been practicing social distancing. Um, I'm glad you're pulling the trails part because that has a disproportionate impact on the district that Jim and I represent. Um, you know, you're going to have an uprising the minute you think about closing down any of these trails whether they're the short ones or the long ones, primarily the long ones, whether it's Fiesta or Camelback. But you've got another issue on your hand, is that it's gonna be disproportionate to certain segments of our population if you don't treat all the trails and all the parks the same. I don't know how you're gonna weave that. From my end, I think it's just gonna be consistent where it's not gonna be favorable towards shutting down any park. I just think it's just not a good idea. Kids need to have an outlet. Families need to have an outlet. They can't be confined to their home. I think it's not good, but primarily the individual on this council, most of you have flatland parks, and that's what you're shutting down. You're going to be closing down your flatland park, and I really think you ought to be thinking about that, but I'm sure you did, so I'm glad you're going to pull it. But at the end of the day, I don't think it's ever going to pass because I think you're going to get people from my district and Jim's district kind of having an uprising. Thank you, Mayor. Mayor. Councilman Williams. Thanks, Mayor. Uh, first, I have a question. In the original motion, was that including dog parks? No. No. Uh, the original motion did not include no. dog parks. Um, so okay. Then I, I support the original motion. I am very concerned about closing trails. I think if you close a few, you just drive people to the ones that are open and you're going to create a problem of having more traffic there than you would if it was spread over. Uh, I am not willing to support closing the trails at this time. Thank you. 
Mayor, Mayor. Mr. Michael. Oh, go ahead. Councilman Nowakowski. Mayor, first of all, I just want to thank Inger and her staff for all her support and out there in the community. We've been hearing a lot of positive stuff about what's going on at the parks. The scary thing was the um, playground equipment and um, hopefully with this that people will be discouraged of playing on the playground equipment. And I agree with Ed regarding the um, um, holding off until Thursday. Thank you. Thank you. And I do want to recognize that we as a city have more acres of parks than any other city in the U.S. and that our mountain parks touch most districts. So certainly Councilman Stark has done extensive work with the mountain parks in her district. South Mountain Park touches uh, District 7 and, and District 8. I mean, we, we really, Councilman Williams has, mountain parks are very important. So I, I certainly don't want to give any impression that mountain parks are not important to every single district in the city of Phoenix. And I also further want to clarify, today's motion does not close any parks. It closes some facilities within parks and is consistent with what many other cities, including several in the East Valley, have done. Mayor? Mayor. Councilwoman Stark. Um, I, I agree with you. I think you can still, especially some of the bigger parks like Lowe's Lawford, even with all the facilities within it shut down, like the playground equipment, there's still a lot of open space that people can relax and rec recreate at. So you can walk your dog around a park right now. We would just encourage you to do it with the immediate members of your family and not your 10 closest friends. Correct. <laughs> and certainly it will turn to the vice mayor to see if, if I misstated the motion in any way, but I think it focused on athletic facilities. Yes, no, that's absolutely correct. And, and playgrounds. Uh, Councilwoman Pastor. Inger, what are our park hours? Uh, Mayor and Councilwoman Pastor, the uh, hours of most parks are between 5.30 and 10 in the evening. Some go till 11, but uh, most of the neighborhood parks are 10, it's opening at 5.30 in the morning. So with the shelter in place, um, once we understand the hours of shelter in place, well then we, will we adjust our hours for the parks? Mayor and uh, Councilwoman Pastor, um, that is something we can certainly talk about, but uh, had not gone down that path yet. Okay, because... I, um, I would say, though, Councilwoman, to your point, if the governor had an order that, that established hours for the shelter in place, we would conform the park hours to that. At, okay, I sure. just wanted to. I don't know. I haven't had a chance to read everything that was written and what it really means, uh, so uh, appreciate it. Uh, the other uh, question I have for you, Inger, uh, since the parks are open from 5.30 to 10 p.m., um, the park is still open. What it won't be available will be the playgrounds, uh, basketball courts, volleyball, and the outdoor fitness equipment that needs to be sanitized constantly, and uh, the sports complex, but the parks are open. I, uh, Mayor and Councilman Pastor, that's correct. Okay, I just wanted to make sure. Mayor. Councilmember Garcia. Does this include golf courses, our golf courses? They would remain open, yeah. which would be consistent with the governor's order on essential services. Although we would say Inger has taken steps in the clubhouses where the food and beverage service is only takeout and they're limiting the number of people in the clubhouses at any one time. Uh, yes, uh, Mayor Councilman uh, Garcia, that's correct. We've actually gone so far as to do like they've done in some of the um, grocery stores as well as some of the uh, pharmacies by putting boxes and X's and saying you can stand here but you can't stand next to each other so they have to stand that distance apart. Uh, the other thing we've done is we've, re uh, we've required golfers not to take the pins out of the, um, out of the holes so they don't touch those kinds of things. And we've also dealt with the ball washers too, so those things. So places where people have points of contact, we've taken those things away from them. It's my understanding Tucson shut down their golf courses, right? I had as not a, As of Friday? Yet. Pretty sure they did. So, do, so if we could find out if they got pushback or something from the governor, because I think that, that we should do that as well. And Mayor? Vice Mayor. And then is there also a possibility um, to also 
you know, just because I've been driving driving around um, and I know that the lights are on really late at night, maybe we can also, you know, with shelter in place, maybe come up with a different schedule of when we turn off lights at the park as well, because that's also an indicator of that the park is open, um, and I think it'd be a good thing for us to look into hours of, of how, how late we want to let the lights on as well. I'll bring back that information as well. Thank you. All right. So I, any additional council member comments? Mayor, yes, Mayor, it's Jim Waring. Please, Councilman Waring. Thank you. So, uh, so the motion doesn't include the trails, but just something to think about because it sounds like it's going to be discussed further. Certainly, I'm not the first and last word of how people are interacting on the trails. I don't know if the rangers, because I've seen rangers out, you know, are, are rangers observing what people are doing? Um, you know, and does it, I don't know if it does or doesn't track with what, what I said, but, um, you know, that would probably be good information to have, even anecdotally from the Rangers. Uh, I also just want to sort of ponder, and I'm in no way saying that the, um, uh, we, we have a lot of trails in District 2, there's no doubt about it, but I, it affects everybody. Obviously, people from all across the city are coming to the trails, so there's that. But I, I just, you know, part of my walking has also been in neighborhoods. And it's funny, after just even a few days, you start to see the same people. People are, this is their thing, and this is how they get exercise. And I would just say, you know, you don't, if, if you push people off the trail, just consider that you're probably pushing them off onto our street. And some streets are laid out great for that, and have sidewalks and so forth. Some aren't. Uh, so I would just also consider that, because I have already gotten the impression the people who are out walking or riding their bikes or jogging, they're going to do it somewhere. And I'm hard pressed to believe, based on what I've seen, with the spacing that I've seen, the behaviors that I've seen from dog walkers, regular walkers, joggers, and, and bicyclists, that they're endangering anybody by doing what they're doing. They're, they're pretty spread out. They're definitely taking steps to stay apart. But part of that is also sort of darting out into traffic and stuff if you're on the street, because uh, I've watched that happen. So even in neighborhoods, that can be a little dicey. So it's just, it's, it's another thing to consider. We are doing this for the public health. So we just don't want to miscalculate and, and cause more of a problem than is actually uh, there. So uh, just, just wanted to make that point. Thank you. Thank you, Councilman Waring. Any additional comments? Uh, would council members like a roll call vote on this? Okay, hearing okay. none. All those in favor of the vice mayor's motion, please say aye. Aye. Any aye. opposed? Aye. No. Motion passes, not unanimously. All right, thank you. Uh, we will next return to government relations to continue their update. Thank you, Mayor, members of the council. Um, I will go over some of the actions that the state has been doing as it relates to COVID-19. But as Frank mentioned at the beginning of the presentation, there has been a lot of stuff going on. We will highlight a few of the items. And again, happy to answer any questions throughout the presentation. The first item that I will cover is Senate Bill 1051, which the le legislature approved on March 12th. What this bill does, it appropriates 50 $5 million from the rainy day fund to the public health emergencies fund um, and while the 55 million dollar comes out of the rainy day fund from the state it was broken down into two pieces the first is that the director of health services is able to utilize the first five million dollars um, to address COVID-19 however if she um, were to um, access the additional $50 million, she does need to notify the Joint Legislative Budget Committee of how she intends to utilize that fund, but it does provide up to $55 million for the Department of Health Services in Arizona. As part of the budget, Senate Bill 1690 was passed as well on March 23rd. What this bill did, it appropriated $15 million to the newly established Crisis Contingency and Safety Net Fund. 
This fund is administered by the governor and it is intended to be used in four different categories. That is for housing assistance, which includes payments to prevent eviction or foreclosures. It also includes money for entities to provide services for homeless persons, including shelter, food, clothing, and transportation. Um, this morning, the governor uh, announced that he intends to use six point seven five million out of the fifty million. Five million is to assist homeless shelters in the prevention and slowing of the spread of COVID nineteen. In addition, the uh, $50 million is also available to be utilized for economic assistance to small businesses with less than 50 employees, nonprofit organizations, and healthcare providers. And lastly, um, the fourth category, it can be utilized for food security. Um, the, the news uh, this morning when the governor announced that he intends to use money, 1.75 million of that is to address food security. Um, we expect that as the situation continues to evolve around COVID-19, that the governor will be putting out more information uh, for the intended use of the remainder of the monies. Other state actions that I, I, I will cover is that last week, the governor announced um, that the state received $5.3 million um, from the Families First Coronavirus Response Act in the form of a grant um, to provide food for seniors. The money would be distributed to the area agencies on aging to provide meal delivery for seniors. And I do know that our human services department will benefit from this as they have a great partnership um, and provide some of these services to seniors. The governor also announced that $5 million will be made available for rental assistance. The program will be managed within the Arizona Department of Housing um, to help Arizonans that have been affected by COVID-19. And that program opened up today. The governor also announced that there's gonna be childcare opportunities for COVID-19 frontline workers. Um, this would be first responders um, and first responders and healthcare professionals that need assistance in the care of their children. The governor also announced that uh, the 211 program would receive an additional $2 million. This is managed under the Arizona Department of Security. Um, the 211 is a hotline that is open to the public and members are able to call in and ask questions and be connected to resources. The governor also announced a partnership with utility providers in the state and um, APS, SRP, Tucson Electric Power, along with six electric co-ops have agreed to not cut, cut off the power um, to any of their customers during this time of crisis. And um, they have committed to that. And I believe that each individual utility has provided out information to their customers. And lastly, I just wanted to mention that this morning, the governor and the superintendent of instruction, public instruction did um, um, provide an announcement that schools will be closed for the remainder of the school years. Um, and as I mentioned, new information comes out almost daily. We will continue to provide regular updates to mayor and council. And with that, I'm happy to answer any questions as it relates to the state portion. Thank you so much for that update. And we are grateful you have information in here that has been out for a very short amount of time. So we really appreciate that. Um, Councilman Nowakowski and I have been talking about, well, the whole council, but um, more specifically, Councilman Nowakowski and I, about um, the homelessness aid. And uh, we both would love to see um, investments that would allow our most vulnerable, which would include medically fragile and our older uh, members who are experiencing homelessness, to have a new location away from the 400 plus congregate living situation at the CAS campus. And I understand that there's several in the advocacy community who are also looking for a way to, or in the homeless services community, way, way to get those most vulnerable people to a, a, a better living situation. So are there opportunities for us to work with the governor on perhaps multiple smaller facilities where we might be able to get a better living situation with that $5 million? Mayor, members of the council, Absolutely, uh, we are happy to communicate with the governor's office and talk about ways that we can partner with, it, with them. My understanding is that the $5 million is to help homeless shelters, um, whether it is to find uh, quarantine housing or temporary isol isolation for um, 
individuals who are experiencing homelessness, um, also for sanitation supplies and services and any uh, other resources. Um, we don't know how those $5 million will be distributed or, or to whom or how they're looking to implement that, uh, but we will definitely communicate with them and, and try to get, gather more information as this continues to move forward. Perfect, and turn to our assistant city manager. And Mayor, members of the council, you'll hear just shortly in a moment from Clark on our federal side. There's also certainly opportunity with our federal funding through our community development block grant as well as our emergency shelter to work collectively as a region, as you indicated as well, with the state to really truly look at these funds as a permanent solution in helping us address the issue of homelessness. Wonderful. I think that would be a great suggestion. Um, our city leadership in the trial budget had talked about a challenge, regional challenge, and that is something with this new COVID-19 dollars that perhaps we could still do to move forward on homelessness, that, that people experiencing homeless are among our most vulnerable to COVID-19. Yes, Mayor, members of the council, as a reminder, you did, uh, all of you challenged staff with coming back in June with a plan to address homelessness, so staff is still working on that plan, as, and as you just said, this gives us an opportunity to look at some of the funding that's been allocated specifically for homelessness. Thank you. So I would ask members of the council, would you be comfortable with government affairs uh, going out and talking about getting a, a better solution for those most vulnerable to COVID-19 to give them an alternative location outside of the Human Services campus? Mayor? Councilwoman Stark. Yes, I would be supportive of that. Um, I think it's important, especially given the, the crisis we're in. Thank you, Councilwoman, and thank, for, thank you for all the work you've been doing around this issue. I would also support it. This is Councilwoman Williams. Thank you, Councilwoman Williams. The governor is about to come out with an economic package as well. So is now an appropriate time to talk about what we might suggest as the Phoenix City Council, the governor prioritize in the economic package? Yes. Okay. And there have been some great suggestions from council members here about where priorities ought to be for the state in economic recovery. So I would certainly encourage council members who have those ideas better to suggest it before the economic package comes out. Yes, Mayor, members of the council, it would be helpful to get a sense from the council what your priority areas are on that because government relations is in contact with the governor's office on a daily basis as they're working through that. And certainly we've had council members speak about the prioritized of, of low income and vulnerable communities and the economic package. So if anyone has specific ideas. Councilmember Garcia. Um, I think definitely as much money as we could get into people's hands directly. Um, had a conversation today about um, the utility relief. I think that's a, a, a great place to make sure that whether it's local nonprofits or whoever's making that happen for people for that to go there. I think we've talked repeatedly on the council, the small business relief, um, getting direct money to them uh, preferably grant, but if not possible, loans. Um, I also think uh, the ability to get some funding towards the cities. I think there's a lot of things we want to do, whether it's in regards to homeless or, or our own utilities or other things that we want to make sure are done. So uh, also giving funding directly to, to the cities to, for us to be able to address these issues. Vice Mayor. And I think also we, I know that there's like different programs that the utility companies have to help people with relief. Um, and I think there's a lot of our constituents that are that are now, and people in the, in, the, in the city as a whole that are struggling to pay their bills. So I think that we need to, whether it is that we have funding where we can pay someone to either call people and let them know listen, these are all the different programs that we have available in order for you to pay your, pay your bill as, as, you, as you see that, that, you can, that you can pay for. Like either having someone that will call people, making sure that we can have the money to send out forms to folks 
for people to understand, okay, we see that you're behind on your bill, so here's fill out this form, and this is the type of program that you can get onto um, to making sure that, you ca that we can make it easy for people to pay their, their bills. As people are getting laid off, more and more people feel that they're getting deeper into, into a hole and, and they stop understanding how, they, how they're gonna pay for stuff and a lot of people will give up. So I think the more guidance that we can give to folks, the more information we can give to them. And if we can hire some folks that will help do those phone calls and put a plan together for, for people that cannot pay their bills, I think that's gonna be incredibly important. Because um, from what I understood from a phone call that we did earlier today, we are, we, those programs are not being used at its full capacity. And I think this, this is a good moment for us to like be able to encourage folks to do that. Um, and again, making sure that we're able to figure out a way, how do we get the, get the relief that we need for the small businesses as well? And then maybe even hiring someone that will help those small businesses fill out forms, whatever they need to do to make sure that we can streamline that process for them as well. Because again, there's a lot of new small businesses that have been opening up. I think everyone here has been doing a good job and we facilitated a lot of these small businesses to open, but now we're gonna have to help them facilitate how do we get them to apply for those grants as well. So probably staffing is gonna be key because I know that right now we just cannot add more work onto people's plates. So I think it's gonna be about um, getting more staff that will help facilitate a lot of these services. Thank you, Vice Mayor. I, I agree that utility bill assistance should be a priority in the governor's economic package, including the bills that we come from city services. So I think that's a great idea. And, and facilities like our family service center should get funding from the state to be able to help administer that program. So great suggestions. Also agree with Council Member Garcia that that small, small business assistance should be a priority for the, for the state as well. C Councilwoman Pastor, did you? Yes, thank you. Um, I just think we have to advocate for relief all across the board of all of our programs. Um, and, and we're gonna need relief no matter what. Um, and, and for it, the relief to get down to our constituents uh, in a way that it's not cumbersome. I would like to see relief not in a form of a loan. Uh, I would actually like to see relief. Uh, we have not, we're not there yet and we haven't seen what uh, is, is possible in the near future. And more and more people will be uh, laid off or will not be able to pay their bills. And uh, I think relief is all across the board. Um, and we will be talking about an item in particular that I think uh, there should be some relief for uh, in, in the water uh, area. The same way that utilities are, are will be getting relief in the future, I think we need to advocate for water relief. So, thank you. Thank you, Councilwoman. Mayor and members of the council, um, Thank you. We will definitely continue to have conversations and keep you all informed of anything that's going on at the state level. Um, I know Clark has um, a lot of information to share as it relates to the state, uh, to the federal legislation, the different packages that have passed. So I will turn it over to him and he will go over that. And, and I think some of the things he will cover kind of talk about at the federal level, um, some assistance at the, to, to people and also to businesses. And, and with that, Clark will go over federal legislation legislation. Thank you, Yesenia. So the U.S. Congress has passed three pieces of legislation to um, combat coronavirus and COVID-19. That first piece of legislation or round one was signed on March 6 and was an $8.3 billion supplemental aid program that was mostly focused on the healthcare industry. Round two was signed on March 18th and was the family's first coronavirus response act. And round three was signed on Friday, March 27th, and was the Coronavirus Aid Relief and okay, Economic now. Security Act, or CARES Act. And this was the $2.2 trillion package that we've heard all about through the weekend. So in round one in the supplemental aid package, there was $3.1 billion for public health and social services emergency fund, 
2.2 billion was allocated to the CDC and prevention with 950 million of that set aside to fund state and local response efforts to the virus. And additionally, there was a billion dollars set aside for the Small Business Administration or SBA for their disaster loan program. In round two, the Family First Coronavirus Response Act, it created two leave requirements, one in the emergency family medical leave and the other in the emergency paid sick leave. These mandates were in place for any private business that has less than 500 employees and all public employer, employers as their employees deal with the virus. And Lori Bays talked about um, these provisions last Monday in, before council. Additionally, the legislation required all health plans to cover COVID-19 testing and also allocated a billion dollars to help all 50 states process increased unemployment claims on a, need, on a needed basis. And then for round three, I'm gonna go through a number of the different provisions that were included in the CARES Act. The CARES Act first provides payments to individuals. So individuals with an addressed gross income up to 75,000 or those who are joint filers with an adjusted, up, with an adjusted gross income up to 150,000 are eligible for the full $1,200 or $2,400 rebate for joint filers. Each family also will receive an additional $500 per child. This will apply to any individual who filled out a tax return in either 2018 or 2019. Most individuals will not have to take any action to receive this rebate check as it'll come back to them through the bank account that they use with their tax filing in either 2018 or 2019. And the rebate amount will be reduced by $5 for each $100 they make in adjusted gross income over the threshold, meaning that the rebate will be phased out for any individual with an income exceeding 99,000 or a joint filer with an income over 198,000. Next, I'll move on to the unemployment insurance provisions of the package. The unemployment insurance provisions begin retroactively on January 27th of 2020 and run through the end of the year or December 31st of 2020. The program will be eligible to anybody who is currently eligible for unemployment and those who, who wouldn't have been but are self-employed individuals, independent contractors, part-time individuals, gig economy individuals, or limited work history individual. Additionally, any individual that applies for unemployment will receive an additional $600 per week payment for each of those recipients, meaning someone who, who receives the max amount in the state of Arizona, 240, will receive $840 per week until that benefit level drops back down to 240 on, at the end of July. Additionally, the program also extends 13 additional weeks for unemployment. So that means an unemployment recipient will receive benefits for 39 weeks instead of 26, and it waives the waiting, the waiting period for benefits. Currently, when you apply for unemployment insurance, you do not receive the benefits until the next week. Under this, under this legislation, you will receive that benefit the week you apply. Next, I will touch on a number of the Small Business Administration or SBA programs. The biggest being the Paycheck Protection Program, which was allocated $350 billion, which will serve as a loan program for small businesses and allows for eight weeks of that loan to be forgiven. Companies with no more than 500 employees can apply and the maximum loan can be $10 million. The loan may be used for payroll, group health benefits, salary and employee commissions, interest on mortgages, rent, and any interest accrued on debt before February 15th of 2020. And the borrower, sh borrower shall be eligible for loan forgiveness for eight weeks if the workforce of that employee, employer remains stable, meaning if they have the same number of employees through that eight week period, either that they had on average during January and February of 2020, or what they had on average during the last six, six months of 2019. The next program I wanted to touch on in the SBA provision was the Economic Injury Disaster Loans or EIDL loan. 562 million were allocated to that program. These loans can be up to $2 million and are always under 4% interest loans. The principal and interest on these loans are deferred for up to four years. And specifically with loans that, are, that utilize that 562 million, 
any applicant that applies for this loan will receive a $10,000 grant from SBA that will not be part of the loan. That will be a grant that will not need to be repaid. Another extremely important part of the legislation was the Coronavirus Relief Fund. This is a $150 billion fund that provides direct assistance to states and localities to use for expenditures during the COVID-19 virus. A minimum of $1.25 billion will be allocated to each state, and it defines localities in the fund as any county or municipality with a population of over half a million or 500,000 will be eligible to apply for these funds directly from Treasury. Of each state's allocation, up to 45% of that allocation will be eligible for these qualified localities based on their population within their state. Within the state of Arizona, there's three cities and two counties that qualify, the cities of Phoenix, Mesa, and Tucson, and the counties of Maricopa and Pima. Under the Housing and Urban Development, or HUD program, there was $5 billion allocated to the Community Development Block Grant, or CDBG program, and it's important to note that these are on top of our normal allocation that we receive every year. Two billion of this five billion will be distributed through the regular program formula within the next 30 days, meaning that the city will receive $9.8 million. And then the additional three billion will be distributed through a new formula that takes into account COVID-19's impact on our communities. One billion of which will be distributed within the next 30 days and two billion will be distributed on a rolling basis. Additionally, within the HUD program, there was four billion set aside for the homeless assistance grants, again, on top of our normal allocation. Two billion will be distributed through the regular program formula within 30 days, which the city would expect to receive 9.9 .9 million of that. And then two billion will be distributed through a new formula that would be based on the COVID-19 impact and the potential for it to spread throughout the homeless community in our, in our community. And that will be within 90 days. Additionally, I wanted to highlight that the Department of Health and Human Services received an additional $75 million for grants to all Head Starts programs. Guidance on how that money will be distributed is, is yet to be seen. Additionally, there are a number of provisions within the housing and urban development program, especially related to both homeowners and renters that I wanted to point out. Any homeowner with an FHA, VA, USDA, or a mortgage backed by Fannie Mae or Freddie Mac is eligible for up to six months of forbearance on their mortgage payment with a possible extension of another six months. Renters in any property that has a federal subsidy or is a federally backed loan, the ones I stated above, have protections as well. Owners of these properties cannot file evictions for non-payment of rent for the next 120 days and cannot issue a notice to leave the property for the next 150 days. There's also a number of provisions I wanted to point out under the Department of Homeland Security. The first being that there is an extension of the real ID deadline from October 1st, 2020 to September 30th of 2021. There was 45 billion allocated to the FEMA Disaster Relief Fund, 100 million allocated to the Assistance for Firefighters Grants, 100 million for the Emergency Management Grants, and 200 million for the Emergency Food and Shelter Grants. As well as under the Department of Justice or DOJ, there's $150 million for the Burn JAG formula grants to reimburse the purchase of PPEs for police departments all across the country. Also on the transportation side, I wanted to point out two provisions. Under the transit um, provisions, there's $25 billion that will be allocated for transit infrastructure to prevent, prepare for, and respond to COVID-19. What's important about these monies is these monies will also be allowed to be used for operations something that is not usually um, we are able to utilize federal funds for. And as Mr. Jim Bennett discussed with you on Thursday, there was a $10 billion um, set aside to prevent and prepare for and respond to COVID-19 that airports all ac across the country will be able to access as the traffic in their facilities is down quite a bit. I also wanted to take a brief moment to discuss a possible next piece of legislation that will be coming, a possible round four. The timing of this will will be sometime in mid-April as Congress will come back after the Easter recess, but discussions have already started on what needs to be included in this, and we will get more and more details on what will be included in this package 
as we get closer and closer to Congress returning. Issues that could be included include mandatory coverage of COVID-19 treatment services, additional resources needed directly to individuals, directly to small businesses, and added resources into the Coronavirus Relief Fund, consideration of an infrastructure financing package to quote unquote rebuild America, and then any technical corrections that have been found to be needed to the first three pieces of legislation that were passed earlier this month. And I, now I'll leave it back to Frank to finish the presentation. Thank you, Clark. Mayor and Council, uh, just with regard to next steps, there's a lot uh, there's a lot of moving parts, a lot of definitions to the legislation that are still occurring. We're working on uh, working on putting all those pieces together and figuring out the numbers uh, with all these uh, individual pieces of legislation or pieces within the legislation and working with our uh, DC lobbying firms to help us figure that out. So at this point, uh, we can take questions uh, from the mayor and council uh, for Clark and myself and the team on the federal uh, program. Thank you. Thank you so much for that. Are there any council member questions? No, with that, thank you so much. Thank you for, for everything, every, all the work that you guys did. And I've never seen someone prepare something so fast in less than 10 minutes. Thank you so much. <laughs> so now I think we're moving forward, getting a procurement update. Thank you, Vice Mayor, members of the council. I'll invite our Chief Financial Officer, Denise Olson. Uh, Police Chief Williams was not able to be with us today due to other things, of course, happening. But and Fire Chief uh, Kara Kalkbrenner here. Vice Mayor, particularly, you had asked us for updates on uh, how we're doing with procurement. So uh, I'll turn it over to our Chief Financial Officer to talk about the efforts going on in this very unusual time for procurement. Uh, right, Denise? Correct. Very unusual. <laughs> Very unusual. Thank you, Mayor, members of the council. Um, we're here today to give you an update on procurement during um, the COVID-19 crisis. Um, what we plan on doing is kind of approaching this from a national challenge um, or just demonstrating how it is a national challenge. We also wanna talk about the resources that are in high demand, what the impacts are on the city of Phoenix and also our current efforts, and then moving forward over the next six months. Um, this is a national challenge. Um, there was a survey done for U.S. cities by the United States Conference of Mayors, and what they found is 92% of the cities don't feel like they have adequate supply for face masks. 88% don't feel like there's an adequate supply of personal protection equipment. 62% have not received any emergency equipment or supplies from their state. And of the ones that have received help from the state, 85% indicated that it was not adequate enough. Now, just, just so you know, this information is, is changing every minute. So again, it's a very fluid situation. Um, just to give you an idea of some of the quantities that um, the survey identified um, areas where we're short, there's millions and millions of face mask requests, PPE items, um, 7.9 million of test kits and also um, we've all seen on the news how we're short of ventilators. So resources that the city of Phoenix needs to be purchasing. Um, it includes, and the utmost important one, is the N95 mask. We've all seen that talked about in the news. The second thing is surgical mask and gloves, wipes and disinfectant, sanitizer, paper products, which includes our infamous toilet paper, and soap and other cleaners. So these are all items that the city of Phoenix is purchasing. So this new world, um, there's limited supplies. Um, we have to figure out how to be smart and allocate what we do have to a wide range of departments. Um, we also have had now three situations where we've put in order for supplies. Two were for masks, one was for um, clothing, protective clothing, that have been commandeered by the federal government. So what happens is we put in the order, and then the federal government comes in and takes that order away from us. So we're not able to get those products. And then the last thing is we're having to put, to put aside our procurement rules and regulations and really trying to be more innovative. But at the same time, we need to be careful that we're buying something that meets our needs, that meets our standards, 
so that we're not buying anything that is not correct, and also we're trying to watch prices. So I want to first talk about masks. This is an area of concern. Um, right now, I'm working with the fire department. And by the way, we've, we're really in sync with the fire department. They're really helping us immensely with their um, inventory area and really helping us with these purchases. Right now, we have about over 67,000 N95 masks. We believe that's going to be about three weeks, if I'm correct. Uh, we have surgical masks, we have over 31,000. And as far as our orders, right now, we're anticipating 1.1 million to arrive in one to two weeks. We also um, are working very closely with all the Valley cities on this order. One thing that we're finding is if we order big, we may have a better chance of receiving that order. Um, the other thing is we have to have a partnership here throughout the Valley. The next order we have is for K95 masks, which the fire department has deemed to be um, able to meet our requirements. And we have, we're anticipating 500,000 over the next 1.5 months, with the first amount coming in about 15 days. So overall, we're feeling fairly confident that we can get through the next six months in terms of masks. The next thing that's been a heavy topic in the city is dif disinfectant and sanitizer. Um, <clears throat> this has changed this weekend. So what happened this weekend is we were able to find a local vendor um, who was previously doing some work for our convention center. Um, and so we're able to get a lot of supplies from them. And these are actual pictures at the fire inventory warehouse. They have set up a mixing machine and they're making this disinfectant product there. You can see that we're putting these bottles out to the departments, including transit, parks, um, as well as our fleet and so forth. So we're feeling very confident about our disinfectant and sanitizer supplies. We also are expecting um, 500 cases of hand sanitizer over the next week. And we also have recently put in an order for sanitizer wipes. So we're pretty comfortable in this area. So looking forward, um, we're going to be monitoring our upcoming orders. We're partnering again with other cities to make sure that um, our orders are, are getting the attention from our suppliers. Um, we're also looking at a lot of options with our local vendors. We're working very closely with Chris Mackey and CED to see if there's any other arrangements that can be made for these um, commodities. And then next, the last thing is we're also, the finance department is working with our vendors on flexible payment arrangements because the, the financial markets are somewhat uh, tight right now. So what we're doing is instead of waiting 30 days to pay our vendors, we'll pay them as soon as we get the product. And with that, we'd be happy to answer any questions. Does anyone have any questions or concerns or suggestions? So Denise, on some of the ply, supplies, because uh, I know that um, in our offices, we were trying to order supplies and we couldn't get supplies. So how does that work? Thank you, uh, Councilwoman Pastor. So what we're doing is we're, we're gathering all the supplies for all the orders and then we're, we're distributing them out. Again, we've got to make sure public safety has what they need first and then we divvy it out as we can as we get the orders. Um, because we've had such success, such success over this weekend, you're going to start seeing supplies come to particular offices in the city. Okay. I was just wondering only because um, there's such a large demand and I definitely think uh, our first responders, since they're on the front line, uh, need the equipment that is needed. I did speak to some uh, firefighters this weekend, uh, and they said that they were getting their supplies. So uh, they had said thank you to me, and I said, oh, well, thank you for doing what you do. So uh, I do know some supplies got to certain stations. So I, I had a question. So are we, are we certain, what, what type of grade of sanitizer cleaning products that are, that, that are required right now given the virus? Because part, part of what I've been hearing um, in some of the different departments 
is that maybe some of the disinfectants that we that we have been using in the last few days, maybe not now, but in the last few days, are not adequate enough or good enough to be able um, to clean to clean the surfaces as well as we we need them to be cleaned. Is there any is there any type of sanitizers that we should be using and maybe we're not, or or what or what type should we be using at this point? Thank you, uh, Vice Mayor. It's a very good question, and uh, and I'll let the chief also talk to this. Um, one thing that we're doing with these products that's coming through Central Procurement is we really are trying to vet those requirements to make sure they're meeting all of our standards. Um, I'm not a chemist, um, but we do have people who are good at that and are checking the products versus what we're buying to make sure that we're meeting those, those standards. Mayor, uh, Vice Mayor Guadardo, just to tag on to what uh, Denise just stated is that there, the CDC as well as the World Health Organization do have specific standards that they need in order to fit a something of a disinfectant wipe or a spray or something along those. So as Denise said, that's we're making sure that those are what's being purchased. There's a lot of vendors coming forward with their personal products. We're asking them what do they have in them. It's supposed to have, I believe, 91% alcohol versus 63% alcohol. There's a percentage of peroxide. So those questions are being asked before any purchases would be made. Thank you. Other questions? Thank you for that update and good luck. We next move to an update on low flow water service program. And we will begin, our assistant city manager will introduce the item. Thank you, Mayor, members of the council. Um, during a public health emergency such as the COVID-19, water services is a critical need for our residents. At the same time, an extended closure of many businesses and gathering places is likely to create economic hardship for many in our community. Recognizing these extraordinary circumstances, Phoenix Water Services has stepped up to help by suspending shutoff of water services for customers who cannot pay their city service bills. What we will describe today is a program very similar to the compliance assistance program started by Phoenix Municipal Court, where committing to a payment plan for delinquent fines allows for full reinstatement of a suspended driver's license. The creative approach to delinquent water accounts proposed by Phoenix Water will likewise restore water service for a similar commitment to pay a deferred amount over time. And here to present this approach is Catherine Sorensen, our Water Services Director, accompanied by our Chief Financial Officer, Denise Olson. Good afternoon, uh, Mayor, City Council. Thank you for hearing this important topic today. Uh, I think you can imagine, um, you know, we offer services to about 1.5 million residents, um, and many of those services are billed through the city services bill. Um, we are continually working to provide fair, equitable, and compassionate service to our many residents, even during normal times. Uh, but obviously during a pandemic, these issues become even more critical. So we have already implemented uh, some changes in service and billing due to the pandemic. I will explain those, uh, but I would also like to talk with you today about more that we can do during this difficult time. So our uh, water equity initiative actually began last October uh, through our Citizens Water Advisory Committee, and I'm sure many of you remember the um, briefings that I've been giving you on this topic. Um, our, we began investigating the provision of low flow water service in lieu of total service disconnects during hot summer months. The idea was basically a way to, uh, the idea was to find a way to avoid those types of disconnects um, during the hot summers here in Phoenix and to still provide a reasonable incentive for folks to pay their bill. Um, so we developed a low flow device in-house. Uh, we began bench and field testing also here in-house. And we researched the necessary code changes for implementation of this type of program. But uh, then, of course, uh, COVID hit.
So under the authority granted me under city code, I uh, gave the order to reconnect customers immediately so that residents could follow the CDC guidelines uh, regarding washing hands frequently. And I really here, I wanna pause and give a huge shout out to Phoenix Water employees in the meter section. When this order came through, they worked tires, tirelessly, 12 hour days, three days straight uh, to get our customers reconnected. And I'm, I'm just really proud of them, really grateful for their efforts. Um, so prior uh, to March 10th, delinquent customers' water service was disconnected as required by city code. Um, after that time, uh, single-family residential water customers who had previously been disconnected due to non-payment were reconnected. And we also ceased disconnecting customers that would then fall into severance for non-payment. Um, and we provided them with a uh, low flow water service, which is adequate for cooking, drinking, sanitary purposes. In addition to this, uh, we are no longer accruing late fees for single family residential customers. Our current plan is to uh, continue to avoid service disconnections, not only during the pandemic, but then of course it's gonna warm up here. It's gonna get very hot very soon. So our plan is to avoid those disconnections during the hot summer months as well. So we're realistically talking about a period uh, between now and probably at least the beginning of September. And of course, um, you know, over that period of time, the city services bill accumulates. Um, so for example, a March bill uh, for your average customer for water would be about $17, for solid waste about $30, uh, wastewater about $25, and then there's various city taxes that are billed through the city services bill, and that would be about $5. So it'd be about $77 for one month. Um, if a customer is um, on a low flow device, then the, obviously the amount of water is less, um, and therefore their total bill becomes less as well. This becomes important over time, um, while people are experiencing financial hardships, if you sum those bills over uh, the time between April and August, you can see that um, our average customer might pay something close, you know, between $550, $600 during that time. Whereas if someone is uh, conserving or on a low flow device, they would pay significantly less than that. Um, we want to be sure that customers do continue to pay as much as they can towards city services bills uh, because we don't want them to encounter a precipitously higher bill later on. Councilwoman Pastor? Oh. I have a question about that bill. Uh, sure. What I saw is the average customer where it went to a low flow uh, was $5 because I know we're talking about water. But what happens with solid waste? And what happens uh, in all the other areas? Because if we know they're not paying uh, the water bill, I'm assuming solid waste is not being paid also. So then how do, how do you then, um, right, those areas? So um, Mayor, Councilwoman Pastor, that's a good question. So um, we bill on the city services bill, we bill for water, wastewater, solid waste, storm water, and then various city taxes as well. All of those things come together as one city services bill, um, and service connections are used for that revenue um, across the board. So um, in this case, to your question, um, the solid waste rate is basically fixed and does not vary depending on different um, levels of service for the most part. Uh, whereas water does, right? So if you consume more, you pay more. If you consume less, you pay less. Does that answer your question? Okay. Mayor, Councilman Pastor, everything is billed on one bill. So irregardless of water doing the low flow, you're still gonna have the solid waste amount on that bill, regardless of the reduction on the water side. But if we know that they can't pay the bill. Is that fair? Is that an equity question? I'm throwing it out there. Yeah. You guys can sit on it, but 
I'm just saying, I'm looking at, if I'm looking at the lens of equity and looking at it in the lens of, of everything. Uh, Mayor, Councilman Pastor, that's exactly what I'm hoping to address. Um, uh, let me go through and explain to you what is in existing city code. Yes. I think Councilman Williams wanted to make a comment. I'm sorry we keep interrupting you, but Councilman well, Williams. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, Mayor, I, I don't, I think solid waste is separate from water, and water is an enterprise fund, and I think solid waste is an enterprise fund. And I don't think it's fair you're asking Sorry. Catherine uh, to do something about solid waste. So I just wanted to make that comment because I think she's being extremely fair to the people who can't pay the bill uh, and to continue to supply them water. Even if it's on a limited basis, they're still getting the water, which still provides enough revenue to the water department to pay its employees and buy the chemicals necessary to keep those plants open. Thank you. Uh, Mayor, uh, Councilman Williams, um, yes, so the, there is one city services bill, and you can see here on the screen, it does include water, wastewater, solid waste, uh, stormwater is also in there, um, and then various city and state taxes. They all come as one bill. They fund different accounts. Um, our existing city code, actually, um, so the revenue collection for all of those charges that I just mentioned is enforced by disconnecting water service. And that is under city code. Um, when an account is past due, uh, the water will be turned off to the premises. Uh, requirements are for the benefit of the consumers of water in the city and for the protection of the water supply system. Uh, and no city employee may willfully ignore enforcement. Once disconnected, uh, full payment of all amounts owed on an account must be paid prior to resuming service. Uh, the water services director is authorized to waive any requirement on a specific case-by-case -case basis where strict enforcement would result in gross injustice. And basically that's what I have invoked uh, to turn the taps back on during this time of the pandemic. Uh, but in summary, uh, while the director is authorized to waive fees in times of hardship, the, de the decision to do that needs to be balanced against uh, the director's overall responsibility to protect and ensure the operation of the public water utility. So uh, the city services bills, um, as Councilwoman Williams alluded to, they fund different things. So the revenues collected for water, fund the, the water revenue, the water enterprise program, the revenues collected for wastewater fund the wastewater utility, the revenue collected for solid waste uh, funds the solid waste utility. And of course, there's various capital programs, um, employee salaries, operations and maintenance um, in those utilities that we're funding through the city services bill. And then um, in addition, uh, as I mentioned, there are some general fund taxes that are billed through the city services bill. Uh, that collects about uh, $55 million in taxes that go directly to the city's general fund through the city services bill. Um, so why city services bills are collected, of course, well, um, the water and wastewater utilities from time to time uh, need to borrow money or, or float a bond to support large capital programs. So um, the water and wastewater utilities are very capital intensive programs. Um, a lot of concrete, iron, steel, very large facilities. Um, it is often better for our customers if we can bond those type of expenditures because they tend to be in the hundreds of millions of dollars at a time rather than pay for them in cash because then if we pay for them in cash, uh, bills would really spike uh, very high in given years where we need to lay out those expenditures and then go back down in other years. Um, so bonding just uh, gives our customers some level of certainty um, in terms of what to expect and some rate stability. Uh, but our water and wastewater uh, revenues are actually pledged to support that bond financing. Um, and our covenants state that the city has covenanted to continuously own, control, operate, and maintain the system in an efficient and economical manner and on a revenue producing basis and will at all times establish, fix, maintain, and collect rates, fees, and other charges 
for all water and services furnished by the system fully sufficient at all times. Uh, our revenues, of course, also pay for uh, employee salaries, O&M costs. And, you know, revenue collection also supports customer fairness. Um, and that helps us maintain public support. Public support is obviously really important to us. Um, and really what this comes down to is to the extent that one group of customers pays less, um, another group of customers has to potentially pay more. Um, and then again, of course, like I mentioned, we do collect uh, money for the general fund, sorry, and um, those, that money helps support employee salaries and various city programs, depending on which fund it goes to. Uh, so how we assist pro, uh, our customers? Uh, first of all, one of the things we do today, um, minus the pandemic, regardless of that, we offer very flexible payment plans. So if you're having trouble affording your bill, you can call us up and say, hey, I just, I'm, I'm in a bad spot, I need some help, uh, and we can help you set up a payment plan. Those payment plans can be very flexible. Uh, they can basically go anywhere from two months to 36 months. We really work um, individually, case by case, with our customers to help set up a plan that works for them and is also responsible and fair uh, for our other rate payers as well. Uh, we fund a customer assistance program uh, through, uh, that is funded about $400,000 by the water and wastewater utilities, approximately $200,000 by the uh, solid waste utility. Those funds can be used uh, to offset uh, the customer bills for people who are in a very difficult spot. That is funded through Project Assist, uh, or I'm sorry, through the Human Services Department. Uh, they uh, administer that program free of charge to us um, and are able to help thousands of families every year. They also offer a, a really more holistic approach. So when families come in and want to take advantage of project assist funds, they also are really good about, um, you know, basically finding other resources for those families so that they can, you know, get back on their feet. So we have some ideas of how we can further assist our customers um, during these difficult times. Um, so uh, what, we can, what we would like to do is offer basically a deferred payment plan uh, for any single family residential customer, regardless of whether they're in good standing or not. Um, and the idea behind this would be that April through August, uh, single family residential bills could be deferred with no late fees applying. So your entire city services bill could be deferred during that period of time, no late fees. And then in beginning, uh, beginning in September of next year, uh, after the hot months, hopefully after things have calmed down with COVID-19, um, single family residential customers could resume payments and basically uh, spread that outstanding amount over about a year or so, uh, depending on their circumstance. And the idea behind this would be that so long as um, the payment arrangement is entered into and then kept, um, the customer would receive full water service um, and, and wouldn't have to go on to a low flow device. Also, I just wanted to, um, to mention that the, uh, and remind folks that the public can actually donate to our project assist. Right now, our customers donate about $100,000 a year uh, towards that program and um, every dollar counts. So um, it's very easy to donate to that program and I would encourage folks to do so. With that, I'm happy to take any questions. <coughs> Mayor, Thank may you. I ask a question? Councilman Waring. Thank you. Uh, Catherine, so if I had to summarize you know, what you said, and it could be wrong, so please check me if I'm wrong, but if I had to summarize it just a couple sentences, I guess I would say it would be really illegal or out of code or however you want to put it to waive fees for people or really alter the plans outside of code um, for either the council or yourself to do that. Second, you're issuing bonds um, on the basis of this current existing plan. You're in that process right now. People can still pull out of that if they wanted to. Investors can still pull out of that if they wanted to. Uh, they may very well be watching this meeting and our actions here today um, to see what we do. But if that happened, a lot of the plans in the water department to deliver water to people, whether they're paying or not, would, would probably collapse. 
And third, based on the experience of what happened, uh, you didn't really touch on that, but in 2000, you know, the, the Great Recession, people used less water, that damaged, the, which normal circumstances would be a good thing, right? To get people to use less water, but this was so dramatic, it really impacted budgets going forward. That was before your time or mine. But that is something we have, we have to be cognizant of too. Every dollar is going to matter because we're gonna have a hard time with next year's budget where the water department is concerned. You talked about the different pots of money and, and so forth. Is there anything that I'm saying that's a misinterpretation if I'm trying to summarize in two minutes what you know you you spent a fair amount of time presenting? Um, Mayor, uh, Council Member Waring, I, um, I'm not an attorney, so it's difficult for me to opine on what's illegal or not illegal, but I, I think you're in the ballpark is, is what I would say. Okay, I, I just, we also have to keep an eye on what's gonna happen next year with, with every city department, but the water department is no different. If water use drops dramatically, which I think could be the expectation if a lot of businesses are closed for a period of time, if restaurants aren't washing dishes and so forth, um, you know, that's definitely gonna have an impact on how many people you can keep on the payroll. And as was indicated, and I, I can't remember who said it, you know, it's, that's, maybe it was you, that's important because those people are doing important work of delivering, as, as Ed has always said, the one product that we really produce is clean water but you do need you know, some employees to do that, and you can't cut too many, you won't be able to deliver the product, and it's a product we all have to have. So this is not, um, this needs, to, whatever we do today and going forward needs to be well thought out for the city as a whole, but certainly for your department in particular, and I don't think I'm embellishing that. Uh, so I just wanna make sure that I wasn't misreading what you were saying, thank you. Thank you, Councilman. And I think the Water Department has really made an effort to be lean and try to have the employees that are needed, but that there's, we are, there isn't, we are running with the employees we need, and so there's not a lot of ability to save money without sacrificing real impacts to customers. No. Um, Councilmember Garcia. So just want to be clear, we're not doing the low flow restrictors from now until August? Um, Mayor, Council Member Garcia, so the idea would be uh, that if you um, are not a customer in good standing, so you're delinquent, you're in the delinquency process now and would otherwise be subject to service disconnection or low flow in this case, call us, uh, go on the web, make a payment arrangement with us. Um, we will defer your bill between April and August of this year, your entire city services bill, enter into a payment arrangement with us, uh, stay current with that payment arrangement, and you will keep full service. If you don't enter into a payment plan with us, or if you decide not to abide by the terms of that payment arrangement, then we would go back to low flow water service during that time. Mayor? Uh, Vice Mayor. So just um, following up, with that just a little bit then. So then the homes that we have applied these, whatever. Uh, it's like a low flow device, yeah. The low flow device, so are we gonna go ahead and take those off, is that what we're doing? Uh, Mayor, uh, Vice Mayor, yes, that's correct. If they enter into a payment arrangement with us and keep that payment arrangement. And are we reaching out specifically to those families that we've already um, put the device in, are we reaching out to them to have that conversation? So we, uh, Mayor, Vice Mayor, we haven't yet because we were waiting to have this conversation, but absolutely, we obviously know uh, where they are and we can do that relatively easily, yes. And then what is our, what is our plan? Because I know we, we just talked about recommendations that we had for APS and SRP and Southwest Gas. Are we gonna follow some of those same models in terms of communicating with folks and letting them know what their options are and what we can actually um, do to help them in this crisis? Mayor, Vice Mayor, thank you so much for asking that question. That is gonna be critically important during this time. Um, we really need to get the word out. Um, we can find them individually. We can find um, the customers individually who are already in the disconnection process, right? We, we know who they are. But there's a, a bunch of customers out there, we don't know who they are yet, 
because they are just now losing their jobs or closing their businesses. We don't, we don't yet know um, who those customers are. And so it would be really important for us to get the word out that, hey, you know, this resource is going to become available to you. Um, and we would work with Wildfire, um, you know, other organizations. Certainly we would employ the media to help us get the word out. Um, that'll be really, really important, absolutely. And then following up just a little bit with um, Council Member Waring's question, and maybe this is more a question for Jeff. I know he's sitting in the back. Um, how, depending on how many people are gonna be disconnected from, would be disconnected from service, it would be nice to know at some point, maybe we don't know now, but as soon as we get that number, how many people would be disconnected and then how many people would actually need to do very small payments? How can we rework the budget to making sure that we're able to cover that? Because the one thing I, I don't want either, I wanna have both, right? I wanna make sure that we can continue with our, with, with our staff and that we're not, that we don't say to people, listen, now we gotta do layoffs because we're not charging our, our, our constituents a water bill. So I like to know how can we, how can we um, redo our budget or what is it that we need to do in our budget um, to making sure that we can keep both things going. One, keep water services on, keep them running, give payment options um, to our customers and then at the same time, continue to support our staff and making sure that we have money in the budget for that. So, uh, Mayor, Vice Mayor, thank you. That's a really good question. Um, so, uh, a couple of things about that. The timing of the pandemic for us here um, in March, um, we're close to the end of our fiscal year. Uh, so, we do expect that revenues will decline because of the pandemic and because of the recession. We don't know exactly how much. Um, we can look back to what happened in 0809 and we could take some reasonable guesses. Well, I think it's going to be better. I think it's going to be worse. Fundamentally, we don't really know. But because uh, the pandemic fell for us in March and most of the fiscal year has already come, um, the impact to revenues for this fiscal year we don't expect to be um, enormous. Let me put it that way. Next fiscal year might be an entirely different thing. And so you're right. We really need to look carefully at how we're collecting those revenues and making sure that we're not doing anything that would put our employees in a bad situation. Um, but one of the things that helps is if we start uh, basically collecting those uh, deferred payments in September, um, that's, and, you know, and, and keep people on payment plans, then you know, we've got kind of a whole fiscal year to kind of recoup those revenues and, and hopefully have as little impact as we can while still being compassionate about the circumstances. Thank you. Thank you, and I just wanna remind people who are watching that in order to practice good social distancing, we are joined telephonically by Councilwoman Williams, Councilwoman Stark, Councilman Waring, Councilman Nowakowski, and Councilman DeCicio. So they are active participants in this meeting appearing telephonically. Uh, Councilwoman Pastor. Um, Thank you for your presentation. Uh, I have several questions. Uh, I would like to know what does the payment plan require? What is associated with the payment plan and what does that look like? So, um, Counts or Mayor, uh, Councilwoman Pastor, thank you. So, um, we can be very flexible with our payment plans. So, uh, theoretically, what it would require is you would call or go online. Um, or visit us in one of our pay stations. You would say, I'm really interested in this deferment program. I would like to sign up for that. Um, we believe that we can actually automate this over the web. Uh, so for those who have internet access, they could just do it themselves from home. Um, you sign up for this plan. We would set you up um, so that your, um, the amount you defer, so beginning in, in September, would begin uh, accruing again and we would set it up so that the amount that, of, that was deferred would be added on to your city services bill beginning in September for the following 12 months. I don't know exactly what that number would be. I can tell you what that would be for average customer, um, but, it will, but the uh, amount deferred will depend on your water consumption over that time. So it'll vary customer to customer. 
On average, I would guess it to be on the order of $40. Uh, but it, again, it's really, it's really difficult to say um, for each individual customer. So for $40, let's, let's, let's do the math, let's see. We're today, we're Mar April, April, May, June, July, August, September, so six months. Uh, uh, Mayor, Vice Mayor, I'm, or, I'm sorry, uh, Councilman Pastor, we were actually thinking April through August and then begin in September. Okay, so five months. So it's $200. And then you would, it'd be like an additional $16 to the $40 that they would pay in. I'm sorry, uh, Mayor, Councilman Pastor, no, our, for, our, for our average customer, um, the amount that we would expect them to pay over that period of time, the amount that they would defer, is somewhere more on the order of $570. We're going into the hot summer months where people tend to use more water, so our average customer's water usage increases during that time. So between those five months, you're, it, the estimate is $570? Is that what I'm yeah. hearing? Yeah, sure. Okay. Yeah. So it'd be like forty-seven fifty that um, a customer could have already. Uh, the bill for September would be forty-seven fifty plus the additional uh, usage of water. I'm going to round up forty or fifty dot bucks. So they would have like a hundred. I'm just going to round a hundred dollar bill to pay in September. So, uh, Mayor Councilman Pastor, more for our average customer, it would probably look something more like $140, $150. For our average customer, the city services bill in total, again, water, wastewater, solid waste, taxes, is on the order of $95 to $100. So it would be in addition to that. So it would be, what, what I guess what I'm trying to say, a water bill will be $100. Then yes. you'll have the additional which we had just went round and round about, solid waste, taxes, and another item that was in there that is part of the bill. So what you're trying to say, the bill could be 140 or $150. Yes, correct, thank you. Okay. Um, is it possible to defer if they need it, if that, they cannot pay the 150 in September? How then do you defer further out in further months? So if I don't want to do a 12 year, I can do a 24. Is that possible? Uh, Mayor, Councilman Pastor, it, it certainly is possible, um, but it will certainly impact our revenues. And what, what we're trying to do is just find that happy balance. Um, that's obviously not easy to find. Uh, but to the vice mayor's point, we also don't want this to impact our revenues to a point where it potentially impacts our employees as well. So we're, we're just trying to find that happy medium. Uh, but certainly we could entertain a, a payback period that's longer than a year. That's possible. Um, we just need to balance that with the impact to our, our budget. The other thing we just have to emphasize, too, is it's not only an impact to our budget and to the uh, employees, but it's an impact to other customers because ultimately the expenses of the water department has to be paid by by the by the customers and if fewer people pay then those who are left to pay have to pay more. So that's that's the balance is the costs have to be paid for and um, at some point it could lead if it gets too much it could lead to needing to raise rates or or cut other programs. Mayor, members of the council, the other thing I might suggest is keep in mind as we go through the state funding and federal funding allocations that we spoke about earlier, we do have an opportunity and we will definitely be lobbying our federal and state agencies to allow some flexibility with current utility assistance so that it could potentially include water so that when we come to September, we could possibly use some of those state and federal funds to pay some of these past due bills for the customers. I think, and we did, I think, to go to your suggestion, we did talk about that right now with our state agenda, but maybe also it should be, we should, with our federal agenda, really encourage the federal government to think about water utilities in the list of entities that have been deeply affected by. Right now, our LIHEAP primarily covers um, 
utility does not cover the water portion, so one of the things we're really pushing hard on is allowing the lie heap to cover water as well. And that certainly makes sense, especially given COVID-19. I have my rest of my question. Oh, <laughs> Councilwoman Pastor. Is there a fee associated with deferment plan? Um, Mayor, uh, Councilwoman Pastor, so the idea is no, uh, but I want to be careful. So the idea is that we would not charge uh, interest during that time on the deferment, right? So let's say you owe three or $250 as we discussed, that would be entirely deferred without interest. However, there are various fees that apply when we disconnect and reconnect customers. Um, so we would have to look more closely at whether we would be waiving those fees. That becomes, again, an issue of customer fairness. Um, but that's a, that's a discussion that we could have. So I want to be clear, we would defer that entire amount without interest, but then there um, is a reconnection fee when, when people are actually reconnected, if that makes sense. No. Oh, and what I'm I, sorry. And, and what I'm hearing is, here's what I'm hearing. <laughs> I'm just going to interpret or uh, respond back what I'm hearing. I'm hearing, no, we're not going to charge interest fees or interest rates, however it works. And then, yes, we are going to charge fees because uh, due to reconnection, which I don't know how they're getting reconnected because they're already getting water, um, but disconnected, they get disconnected and then reconnected and we're gonna charge fees. Uh, Mayor, Councilman Pastor, that's because I uh, messed up, I'm sorry. I'm back in normal world, not COVID world. Um, in normal world, there is a fee for reconnection. In COVID world, there is not. So yeah, I'm sorry about that. And then my last one is, what is your plan? I would like to know what the plan is or if the, a plan is, if a plan has not been developed, uh, I'm requesting a plan to be developed on how you were going to educate all the water consumers about this program because I'm going to make a big uh, assumption, which you're not supposed to, uh, but I think I'll be on target that there are going to be more and more uh, people that will not be able to pay for their water bill and uh, will want to find different ways or sacrifice different ways in order to get water. So I think this is bigger than just the ones, the, the, the ones that are unable to pay at this moment because I think it's gonna grow even bigger. So I still feel like we will be back in this discussion to talk about rate hike and to talk about employment. Uh, we are going to have to make some hard decisions in the future if this continues. And uh, I think this is just a reality of where we're sitting today and, uh, and ways that we're gonna have to figure this out. Uh, but rate hike is gonna be on the table anyways in a, a, another year or year and a half. So uh, that's, that's a discussion and we will have to make some hard decisions. So I just wanna put that out there. Thank you. Mayor, may I ask a question? We'll go to Councilman Waring and then Council Member Garcia and then the Vice Mayor. Thank you. Uh, Catherine, the, the low flow program is really an attempt not to shut off water to people, if I had to summarize it. Is that a fair statement? Uh, Mayor, council member wearing, yes, that's correct. I, I, to Councilwoman Pastor's point, you know, that you're still going to have your bill, which you were really unable to pay in the summer but you're gonna have now your lower bill because we're getting into the fall months. There's only gonna be less, or will be probably less for sure. But then you're gonna have this other bill so that you're really paying sort of two bills effectively. Even if you're on a payment plan, even if you spread it out over 18 months, you're still gonna be paying more than you would have been paying on your normal bill for sure, which you're already struggling to pay. I'm unclear what favor we'd be doing anybody by building up a bill that, that, that they may still be very uh, unable to, you know, they may be unable to pay, as opposed to just continuing at the low flow plan, which I think I'm correct in saying this, people are already on. That's already been implemented, correct? Uh, Mayor, Vice Mayor, or Mayor, Council Member Waring, yes, that's correct. 
So we're already implementing a plan, so now we're changing it. I understand, you know, the circumstances have changed pretty, pretty dramatically, but we thought this plan was fair enough before to let you implement it and authorize you to implement it. I'm not really sure what's changed if we're luring people into a trap where they're just gonna have bigger bills that they still can't pay, and then when they can't pay, you're gonna force them to go on the plan that we're now sort of abandoning. Um, I don't know what's being accomplished by that. Right, so Mayor, uh, Council Member Waring, no, I guess the, I, so well, let me back up. Um, this council did not authorize me uh, to reconnect customers and implement low flow program. I just did that under my authority under code um, to prevent gross injustice. Um, and the idea behind... Well, I guess let me, let me put it a different way, if I can interrupt. We didn't stop you from doing it. Uh, yes, that's, that's correct. Now. Yes. <laughs> um, and the idea would be a deferment, right? Um, yeah. And you're right. People do run the risk if they if they absolutely stop paying um, and don't continue to pay what they can towards the bill, then they will face a higher bill than they otherwise would have. That would be true of any deferment program. The idea really would be just to give people space uh, so that they can get their finances in order. A lot of people are obviously you know, in a panic right now. Um, get them time to get their family finances in order uh, and then be, able, be in a better place to pay that bill. The low flow program, uh, Mayor Catherine, the low flow program provides enough water to live on, enough water to be sanitary, obviously important in any time, but certainly, you know, even more so now given the, the virus. Um, I just, when you go to explain the Council on Pastor's point, and maybe it's a different version maybe at that point, you know, I would hope you would sort of lay out the pros and cons that you may be better off, particularly if you're already on this program and making it work, to continue with that rather than build up a bill, which may lead you down the same path and you just have a bigger bill. I'm just, I'm just concerned that this, this plan is not necessarily benef beneficial long term to the very people it's designed to benefit. Sometimes people don't pay. I mean, that's that's just that's a normal time. We've got some people who don't pay, and the people who do pay have to pick up the slack. But in the interest of fairness, we want to make sure that that doesn't happen more often than it absolutely has to. But I am concerned we may actually wind up with more of that rather than less um, if if too many people avail themselves of this particular plan. It's just it's just a concern. Um, going forward, and we may have to pay that piper, I guess, really at the end of the next fiscal year when we realize how many people didn't pay. So. Thank you. Is that uh, Council Member Garcia, unless Councilman Waring has an additional question? No, thank you, Mayor, though. I appreciate that. Perfect. Council Member Garcia, followed by our Vice Mayor. <clears throat> All right. As part of public health recommendations right now, we're asking people to stay home. Children are not gonna be in school until August. We're asking folks to wash their hands as much as possible <clears throat> and to stay hydrated and take showers. That's what we're asking people to do. So I think because of public health, we have no option but to maintain during this uh, crisis full flow and then figure out later what we're gonna do. I think along with the plan that Councilwoman Pastor put out there, I think we need a plan to make sure that that financial hit doesn't get us as much as it should, whether it's with Yesenia and, and Frank and these folks at the state level, at the federal level, and also <clears throat> with private philanthropy who's now gathering resources. And I think it's our responsibility to make sure to put forth a plan so we offset those things and make sure that what Councilman Waring is talking about does not happen to those most vulnerable families. But I do think that the right thing to do because of public health is to make sure that we remain with folks water on and with their full flow to make sure that they can stay hydrated, wash their hands, take showers, um, and, and, and especially as we're closing down other options for them, that their homes 
be a sanctuary and a place where they can make sure to take care of their health. Vice Mayor. Yeah, I, I, I think that if we, if people start feeling that they gotta be restricting their water, it's gonna be even more dangerous for folks as it is. There's many people, right? At least I have a lot of family members, close the water, don't waste so much water. We got a water bill to pay. So I just think that the more that we restrict people on being able, and, and not that people should be irresponsible with the water, but I, I just think that we just need to make sure that we have a good PR campaign and that we have a good, a good program on making sure that we give people all the materials that they need to be responsible with their bills. Um, I just think that that what what our constituents are going to need are they're just going they just need that guidance. I'm sure that a lot of our constituents that are going to be suffering through this are are not thinking. Well, I'm just not going to pay my water bill. I, I bet you majority of them are just frustrated and wanna and wanna understand how to pay their how to pay their bill. So I think if we have a good campaign, if we put out the resources that we need and we give them guidance towards this, I think we'll have a lot of people paying more for their bill than they would if we don't give them that guidance. Um, I think I think that's one thing. And then the second thing, I just don't think that we can as a city. Um, as we leave from SRP and from APS and as to work in partnerships with them if we're not doing the same thing um, with, with, um, with, with the water department. I think, I think those things are, are clearly, are, are gonna be working together and we need to make sure that we, that, that, we, that we do that and that we make stuff happen. And uh, cause I think people just need guidance. They just need guidance on how to, how to pay their bill. Um, because, and then I also am curious to see, and I know that you don't have this right now, Catherine, is how many, you know, gi given how many people we did, I would like to know how many people do we actually currently on a normal day disconnect? How many people actually do, don't have their services running? And then also maybe um, projecting into the future maybe getting briefings from you to trying to figure out, okay, th this is how much the number of people not paying their bill we're, we're getting and how many people, and, and then from there we can decide how many more people we need to help set up and putting them on a plan um, to pay those, those bills. Because right now, like we're just assuming, you know, it's a pandemic, there's a lot of people that are going for unemployment, I get that. But I would like to see at this moment how many people are actually not paying their bills. And I know you don't have that information right now, but you know it'd be good to see that so that we can project into the future how many people would actually not pay their bills. Thank you. Council members Mayor. on the phone, Councilwoman Williams. Oh, thank you, Mayor. Uh, Catherine, is it possible that people could make a choice because you get water on the low flow. I mean, you turn on your tap, you're gonna have water. You may not have the pressure that you have for full uh, amount, but you still have water. And if that was an option all summer long up until September, I think a lot of people, especially seniors, would appreciate that. Uh, they're not using high volume in their yards and other places, uh, but the low flow supplies everything they need and they wouldn't accumulate a large bill to have to worry about in the coming year. Is that possible? Um, Mayor, Councilwoman Williams, yeah, it, it is. In fact, um, our, our estimate is that um, folks who are on a low flow device use about as much water as those who carefully conserve and stay within our uh, lifeline allowance that is included in the um, fixed charges. So yeah, you could, yeah, um, and a lot, we see that in our customers. A lot of them um, are very cost conscious. They wanna minimize their city services bill. And so they're very careful to use only the amount of water that is included in um, our, allow our monthly allowance. So it's basically equivalent to that. Thank you. Councilman Pastor. So my understanding with the low flow device, the low flow device um, 
is average, I think, 22 units. Uh, 17,000, I don't know what, but we, have, we figured it out to be 22 units of water for uh, a month. And uh, as you just stated right now, is those that conserve their water uh, would be in that category of, of kind of low, low uh, if you had a low flow device. My question to you is that we made these low flow devices in house. So is, do we have the ability to uh, look at uh, when someone who is, uh, would be considered to be placed on a low flow device to look at or have the ability to look at when they're getting close to uh, 13,000 or 13,000 uh, or let me say 18 units of water that then at that moment we trigger and say they're getting close to this, this piece to call and say, okay, you're at this point, this is where we're possibly now gonna put you back on the low flow device because you're gonna reach the amount of the, seven or the 22 units. There has to be a way that we can uh, do this uh, where it is also uh, providing the water, but also in a way trying to change behavior or understanding of what, how the water operates and how you go over certain units. Um, and we know that 22 units is, is a great average as a, in the conversations that I have had uh, for a month of a family of four. Uh, but right now, in the crisis, we are in the middle of a crisis where a family of four is sitting at home. And what is being recommended is to, well, in my house, what's happening is every two seconds we touch anything, we are washing our hands. Now, with four people in the house, uh, using the restroom is a, a fine dance in my house because we only have two restrooms and sometimes you know two restrooms are being full and uh, flushing with a low flow device now means I have one toilet uh, that I cannot flush and then when I flush that one the other toilet is waiting to be uh, filled uh, there's a fine dynamic that happens in a household on top of that we are uh, sanitizing or I'm mopping my house almost three times a day because of everything that is happening. Um, and I, I even sanitize my outside patio uh, just to uh, make sure that I am doing what I can do to prevent this virus in, uh, entering my home. Uh, but we're in a crisis and I get it. I understand, I understand you're looking at budgets. Everybody's looking at budget, but at this moment, budgets are kind of out the door in the sense of, of we have no prediction of our future. I don't even have a prediction of my future, what my finances are going to look like. So we have to do right now what is best for our whole community to keep everybody safe and healthy in, in this process. Um, and I understand the finances. I balance a, a budget in my house all the time, but if we can figure out a different low flow device that, that was made and maybe a little larger, I don't know the dynamics of it, I don't know the engineering behind it, but those are the innovation or solutions we wanna come up with in order to have a strike of a fine balance of the finances and the community. Um, so those are just some ideas of what, I, what we were talking about earlier and how this works. But I also know with the low flow device, if I was, um, I'll tell you a personal experience of that, what happened in, in my grandfather's home where my dad lived, is that we had low pressure. So what happened in our home in the low pressure is there was always several buckets in the bathtub in order to have water, water in order to uh, flush the toilet because the way the home was made, um, and running water didn't run through the, through the house until my dad went to college. So when we were born and we were there, we had to use the buckets and be able to use the water to flush the toilets. A low flow device reminds me of that. And 
we are in this day and age of that we need to help everybody around to be able to have the water, ad adequate water. If it's 22 units, that's great and it's fine. Figure out a device then to stop at the 22 units. That's just, this is just reminding me, it just triggers me back to the days that we were <laughs> having buckets and putting buckets in and, and, you know, this is what it reminds me of. Thank you, Councilwoman. My hearing is imperfect, but did Councilwoman Stark? Um, Mayor, no, I'm sorry. I, my phone keeps slipping in and out. I'm having a hard time. Yep, th thank you. And again, wanted to thank the council members, William Stark, Waring, Nowakowski, and DeCicio, who, who are on the phone. Okay. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Catherine. Uh, we will, at our Thursday policy session, just wanted to reiterate, the council wants to understand how to best support common sense social distancing while still supporting outdoor activities. So we will have an update on national best practices on that on Thursday. Thank you, we are adjourned. <laughs>